Good evening. It's good to see everybody who's made it back out with us this evening. If you'd like to turn your Bibles to Matthew in chapter 5, we're going to pick back up on the, our Beatitudes. It's an amazing thing. When we start talking about attitudes, it, how it really pricks to our hearts. And what I mean by that is, when we're, when we're presented the information, it really is presented in such a way where we, we look at it and say, maybe I need to be a little bit more like that. There's something in this for me, and so I need to, to pay a little bit more of attention. And when, I, you know, when we start going through the Beatitudes, we're going to start reading in verse 3, we're going to pick up in verse 7. All these Beatitudes really build on one another. What it is, is it, it starts out with one and the other one, because this one is true or because we start living this way, there's another one on top of it. And then once we start adding that one, the next one's on top of it. And it, 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 it's really a building effect or a, an escalating effect when we look at the Beatitudes. And notice what he says starting in verse 3. It says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Again, to look at these, the first one, again, the, the being poor in spirit, the whole idea is we are anything we are by the grace of God. We're, we're, you know, when we start thinking about our life and our life's direction, we, we're morally bankrupt when we start that pathway of sin, and yet in Jesus we're able to have a hope of heaven. But we, when we look at this idea of being poor in spirit, the whole idea is that we're not good enough on our own. And we do sin, and we do fall short, and we do need a Savior. It falls into this idea of mourning. See, when we see the sin around us, the sin that we've committed, and the sin that others around us have committed, and we look at the world around us, it should make us really sad sometimes. When we start thinking about how much sin is in the world and the effects of sin, it should break our very hearts. Now notice again, we go back and just put those two ideas together. We're poor in spirit because outside of Jesus, we're never good enough. And we look around, there's sin everywhere, and everybody needs a Savior, even us, even us. And that's a mournful type of idea, but you'd be comforted. Why? Because there is a Savior. There is a Savior. There are brighter days ahead. Looked at the idea of being meek, and the idea of being meek or humble in this, in this context is the idea that I really want to follow where Jesus goes. I really want to walk in those footsteps. I really want to go out and, and be the person that Jesus was when he was on this earth. I want my life to be like his life because Jesus is the one that gives comfort and gives hope. And I also want to help do that because God wants us to do that. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be filled. We'll, we'll never run out of good things to do. There's always more to be done. And, you know, it's all, you know, again, it's like if we use uh, just a, a worldly illustration that helps us out. I, I knew a friend of mine who's, who believed with all their heart that dirty dishes and dirty clothes came from heaven because they were blessed with them every time they turned around. Do you all, it, the idea is there's just always more to do. And it's not a checklist thing, but the idea is there are people who are hurting and we can help. There are people who are brokenhearted and we can help. As we struggle with sin and we understand that, that, that we need forgiveness, they also need forgiveness. And God loves us, God loves them. And we have a hope and a future, and we want them to have a hope and a future. And so we look for people that we can impact in a positive way, saying, God really does love you. And no, you're not all alone in this world. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. I mean, really, when we sit back and look at ourselves, notice how that buildup was. Every single individual that we've ever known, including ourselves, needs mercy. Every single one of us. Every one. And the way that Paul would write it, there's none that is good, no, not one. And so when we start looking at this idea, as I mourn my own sin, I, I can mourn your, your sin. 
And as you mourn your sin, you can mourn my sin. And as we talk about the people that we meet on an everyday basis, we understand they're not perfect. And since we need forgiveness and we understand what that looks like, to, to not want to bear the, the penalty of all the things going on with us, we should extend that to others. Extend it to others. So they can benefit as well. You, you see how that builds up? We need a Savior. They need a Savior. We want so bad for someone just to give us a break. Even if it's for five minutes, somebody else needs that too. Somebody else needs that too. And so we can extend that mercy. Now, mercy, what does that mean? Mercy is something that, that is not earned. It's not something that is due anybody. It's something that's given to somebody, even when they don't deserve it. But it's a good thing. I mean, how many things do we get we don't deserve, and it's a bad thing, and we can start writing those things down, right? And how do we feel when we get those things that we don't deserve? But they're bad. We, oh, it's terrible. It's so bad. But what happens when we're under a load of stress and somebody decides to help us? Somebody gives, gives, us, the, 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 gives us grace or mercy or forgiveness. It's almost as if, if you can imagine going to the Walmart and you have all these bags in your hand. And you carry in all these bags, and it's really heavy, but for whatever reason, you, you feel the need not to take the buggy out, and you have all these bags in your hand. And you go to the car, because that's where you have, you're going to put these in here, but you haven't thought far enough out to how you're going to open the, the trunk of the car. But here you have, you have all these bags, and all you want, I, I just want someone to open the lamp. Because if I lay this down, I know every bottle of pop I have is going to go all the way down the, down the parking lot. What would happen to somebody? Now, I know I'm not saying we need to go open anybody's doors and our trunks. That can be bad. But I, what would happen if, if somebody come and open that door for you? And maybe it's somebody you don't expect. Maybe it's somebody in this, in this congregation today. You're having all this trouble, and somebody sees you and says, hey, would you let me open that door? And like, yeah, please. Or maybe it's somebody, you know, it's somebody you know, you're like, I, just a little bit, just a little bit of ease of my trouble, that's all I'm looking for. So we know what that would feel like, don't we? And what Jesus is saying is be merciful to other people. So what does that look like? Let's go ahead and look at Scripture, Luke chapter 10. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at three different instances. We're going to start in Luke chapter 10. And we look here, what I want to do is, is put mercy in, in the positive light. Now, as we look at it in the positive light, we're going to see people here that are not so merciful in this parable. And as we look at them, we get to see that contrast. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go in two other places, at least two places, and we're going to look at this contrast between mercy and something else. And as we look at this contrast, what I want us to do is say, I want to be more like the merciful person and not like the contrast. Because if I'm like the contrast, then I'm not who I need to be. And so let's look at Luke chapter 10. We're going to start reading at verse 25. Notice what the scripture says. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, him being Jesus, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, that's an honest and honorable question, isn't it? Walk up to Jesus and say, what can I do that I inherit life? What was Jesus' answer? He said to him, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and, you, and your neighbor as yourself. Now, I don't know that if he overheard Jesus talking about the greatest two commandments, but this is exactly what he tells Jesus. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love the Lord your God with everything that is in you. With every fiber of your being, you want to, to love God with that. And not only do we love God, but we love everybody else like we love ourselves. And the idea is we truly love people that are around us. Not mouth only, but we truly love them. What was Jesus' words? You've answered rightly, do this and you shall live, or you will live. Now, that's, that's quite a statement from Jesus, isn't it? You live life like that, 
and you will get life, eternal life. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now, again, we looked at motivations on last Wednesday night. Let's notice the motivation. He wants to justify himself. He wants to make himself say, oh, I, I've done this. this is, I'm on the way. I got the ticket. I'm good to go. Really, what we need to focus on is what would God say about us? See, God's the one that ultimately justifies. And so it's not so much that we get to elevate ourselves that my ticket is punched, but it's, it's, there's more to that. And so what he says is, who is my neighbor? Who is this person? In other words, you might sit back and say, was, was I nice to them? I mean, the people in my neighborhood, I mean, that, they're nice people. I'm a nice person. I mean, we're getting along. Am I doing it? Am I in? So what Jesus does is he gives a parable. And this parable is a throw alongside. It's a big illustration about what he's talking about. And at the end of this illustration, he gets to decide whether he's doing what he said he wanted to do or not. See, so he opens the door, opens the eyes to see it. Notice what he says. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. So let's paint the picture. Now again, this is a made-up story. It's not real. But notice the, the picture that Jesus paints. Here you have this guy. He's a priest. He's of the tribe of, of Levi. He's from the lineage of Aaron. He's able to offer sacrifices in the temple. He's able to work there and light the, the candlestick and, and eat the showbread and change that out and light incense. He, he's one of these people that go to the house of God to work. And he was so wrapped up in going to that place, he scoots on the other side and keeps going. Now think about it. And then we have a Levite. The Levite has the ability. He's not a priest, so he can't offer sacrifices. But he can work around the temple, keep things tidy up and things like that nature. He's heard the sermons. He's heard the songs. He, he, he knows exactly what's going on. And when he comes across this guy, he skirts him. goes on another side. See, they were so wrapped up in where they're going, they, they didn't see the guy. See, that's really the point. That's what this is going to. Because we have a Samaritan. A Samaritan and Jews don't always get along. You remember the Samaritan at the well? What did she tell Jesus? What do you Jew have with me, a Samaritan? She understood. She understood that there was a cultural difference there. And she wanted to know, why are you asking me something to drink? What's the motivation? What, what do you got going on here? Mercy can be seen in the actions of the Samaritan. See, notice what he says. Remember, that's what this parable is about. About loving your neighbor, having mercy on them. Notice in verse 33. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He saw the distress of the individual. See, that's what he saw. How many people have you seen today? Okay, I get, I, you, had, you saw probably at least 100. I, I didn't look at the attendance this morning, so I don't know. But somewhere around 100, right? We, we saw that many people. I guarantee some of us were hurting. I guarantee it. How many people did you see after that? I mean, if you go out to, to Monterey's, you might have seen a handful of people you know. I did that. But yeah, I saw all these people I didn't know. And there's somebody there that's hurting. If you go to Walmart, you could have seen a thousand people. A thousand people. 
See, when we're having mercy, the idea with that is we see the distress the person is going through. I mean, really, and I, I've said this. Have you ever been there? You're standing in line at the Walmart because you want to talk to a real person. And they're backed up because other people want to talk to real people too. And say they've done something wrong, which happens. You've done something wrong? I do stuff wrong. Even at chance I'm in a hurry, there are times I use getting things wrong. I do that sometimes. They mess up. We have an option. You know their day's been stressed. How many people they seen? I don't know. A lot of people. And I wonder how many people, once that they are in that situation and, and there was something that got messed up, something wasn't exactly right. It, it happened. It's there. I wonder how many people say, it's okay. It's okay. I got all the time. You want to have somebody look at you funny? You say, it's all right. I'm not going to yell at you. I'm not going to yell at you. It's okay. See, it's the seeing the distress. Yeah, it might put us behind 10 or 15 minutes. But what are they feeling? See, it's seeing that distress. Seeing that distress. Notice what he had. He had compassion. Not only did he see the distress, he had compassion. He felt for that person. They were in a really hard situation, a really hard one. And unlike us, we don't always know what people are going through. The Samaritan, he saw, he's beaten, left for dead, he's naked, he's by the roadside. I mean, you, you can't get much open than that. And he had compassion on the person. See, mercy is pushed by compassion. I hate that you're going through that, whatever that is. But not only do you hurt because they're going through it, you try to take some kind of step to alleviate what you can. Now, I'm not saying we can heal all the world's hurts. I'm not saying that, but we can at least make someone feel a little bit better for five seconds. That's the whole, I'm, I'm not going to yell at you. It's okay. Five minutes. I got all the time in the world. Had some other day, we, we stopped and got some some drive through I don't remember which place it was. I picked something up, and they said, oh, we're sorry it took so long. Is it hot food? Well, I'm not worried about it as long as it's hot. I don't care. I'll wait for that. Is it good? Yes, yeah, it's good. What, what's the problem? There's no problem. See, it takes steps to alleviate some of the hurt, whatever you can, whatever you can help. Again, we can't fix everything, but we can make somebody feel important for five seconds, five minutes. And let them know that people are not all bad. People are not all bad. And then when we look at this, I mean, he goes on. You know, how do you see that? Well, he bandages him, and, and he puts him on his own animal, takes him to an end, takes care of him. Now, the idea with that, you know, if you want to kind of think about it, somebody fell down in Walmart, you had a Band-Aid, and you got some uh, some triple antibiotic ointment. There's something for that. I don't remember the, the big name. But you put it on there, and so people, you know, and you give them the Band-Aid, and they they say, oh, I'm so glad you had that. Um, but the idea is you just you do what you can, the healing part. Do what you can, even if they're an enemy, even if it's not always socially acceptable. So you remember who takes care of the Jew. The Samaritan guy. Remember there's a conflict there? They don't always get along. How do you know that? What did the lawyer say? Who was, he the, one, who was the one that showed mercy and loved his neighbor? Well, the guy that helped him. What, what was he? See, he didn't say it was the Samaritan guy. So you look at this. I mean, mercy acts like that. Mercy sees the distress of people, and we, we have compassion, and we feel for them, and we do the best we can, and no, we can't fix every single hurt. And some things are, are heavy, you know, worse than just a Band-Aid and, and some um, triple antibiotic ointment. I mean, there, some is really hard. Sometimes it's a, 
crying and you listening and saying, I don't know how we, you can get through this. But I'm here if you need to cry. If you need to holler and scream, we're here. If you need help looking at the future, I can paint the picture. I don't, I don't know. See, that's the thing. Relenting maybe of some punishment or, or not being so, so hard on someone because it didn't necessarily go their way. Your way. It's the extending the mercy. It's giving them what they need. See, what we had is we had some people who, who went about their daily life versus people who took time to care. See, that's what we have in this parable. So let's see sometimes that's contrast in Matthew chapter 9. Now, as we look at the Matthew chapter 9, there's something that, that probably will pop out at us. So what I mean by it is, you don't have to have the word uh, Pharisee, uh, the priest, and Levite. What we're going to find here are Pharisees. And notice what we're going to do. We're going to look here just for a second and how these people looked, acted, and behaved. Notice what he says in verse 10 of Matthew chapter 9. Now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house, that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? In other words, why is he keeping company with them? Why is he with them? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. And this is one of those underlying circling things that you want to, to kind of to pay. If you're one of those people that like to do that to, for further study and look at. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Notice what Jesus contrasted there. Now, he's not the only one. We're going to go to Hosea chapter 6. Um, but when we start looking at this, have you not read, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Because after all, if they're hanging out with sinners and tax collectors, they're unclean. They feel like they can't go and worship God correctly. They're more worried about that presence than about helping these people know who God is. You think they got hard-hearted? I would say they did. Notice how he puts it, in, how God puts it in Hosea. Chapter 6 and verse 6. It's after Daniel, before Job. Notice what it says starting in verse 1. He says this, Come and let us return to the Lord. He has, for he has torn, but, but we, he will heal us and is stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, oh, here it is. After two days he will revive us, and the third day he will raise us up, that we may live in his sight. Let us know. Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. He is going forth and established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain in the earth, to the earth. O Ephraim, what shall I do to you? O Judah, what shall I do to you? Or shall I, yeah. For the, your faithfulness is like morning, cl uh, morning cloud. And like the early dew, it goes away. Therefore, I have hewn them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and your judgments are like light that goes forth. For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Now notice, really, when we start looking at verse 4, the first three verses talks about time they were, they were taken away, and they're supposed to come back. But notice how God talks about their faithfulness. It was like a morning cloud. Now, we live really close to the Smoky Mountains. We know what morning cloud looks like. How long, is morning, how long does the fog stay there? It don't stay very long. You wake up and everything's foggy, and before long it's burnt off, it's gone. Their faithfulness was like that. Why was their faithfulness like that? What were they focused on? I desire mercy and not sacrifice. What was their focus? The sacrifice. The ritual. That was the focus. 
not mercy. What did God want? God wanted mercy. What did they want to give him? Sacrifice. Notice how it goes further. And the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. What did he want them to have knowledge? What did they give him? Burnt offerings. You see the contrast? One deals with the internal part of the heart. The other, rituals. Going through motions. See, that's when we look when we look at mercy. Mercy is more than just obligation. Mercy it comes from who we are. Something that's within us. It's a beatitude. Why is it a beatitude? Because we need to be merciful to others. Why? For we're mindful that we need mercy. We need mercy. And so we can extend that. We can extend it. We can give it to other people. Does he say he do, didn't want their sacrifice? He didn't say it here. Isaiah 1, he outright says it. But he doesn't say that here. They should have the one without the neglect of the other. See, what this looks like is the same thing Jesus um, charges the scribes and Pharisees with in Matthew chapter 23. Notice what he says. We're going to start looking at the 23rd verse. And we can go further if we need to because there's a lot, a lot in here. But notice what he says in Matthew 23, 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglect, neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Now think about it. What's the picture? That they strain out this little bitty insect. I won't call it a bug for different reasons, but it's an insect. I mean, you know what gnats look like. Again, we live in East Tennessee. You know, we know what they and they are aggravating. They're little. Say one of them flies down in your coffee or your tea or something. And I said, huh, well, look at that. And you just get, you, just get, you dip it out, and you throw it away, and you continue drinking your drink. And that's the picture. Now, could you imagine a camel jumping in there? Now, we don't have those. But could you imagine a dog climbing up in there and, and choking on that thing? See, they, they took so much time to dissect the minutia. The very smallest particle of a part. And they couldn't see the big picture. They couldn't see it. They should have seen the big picture. Mercy and justice and faithfulness. See, that's the overarching. If we get that right, guess what we'll see? The little parts. But if we're focused on these little bitty parts, how are we going to see the big picture? You know, when learning to drive, you remember when you learned to drive, right? Hey, did you teach anybody else to drive? Now, one of those two hopefully fits most of everybody in here. I know we got some young ones. You'll be there in a minute. Uh, the idea is when they're starting to drive, where do people want to look at? The hood. They want to look at ruts right in front of them. But what do they not see? The curve coming up. And they're looking right here and they're going, oh, there's a curve. They say, you got to look up for that. There's something coming. See, that's the idea. When we're living by faith and we're showing love and mercy and justice and we are looking at the big picture, those small details get added in. But you don't see the big picture when you're focused. On just a little part. See, that's that contrast. That's that contrast. So don't focus on the, only the small picture of what you think you see. Focus on the bigger picture. See, the idea of mercy is Jesus says mercy is weightier than doing all those other little things. It carried more weight. Why does it carry more weight? Because it's not just a mindless doing of something. It's an, inten an intentional act of the heart. 
to show mercy to somebody. So you see the contrast there? See, when we show mercy, we remember who we are and what we need. And we can remember who they are and what they need. And then we help them. Now, does it mean that we never have justice? Justice is here, and sometimes we need to get exactly what we deserve. I understand that. But there's also a place for mercy. And we got to live it. We got to live it. When we think about doing unto others as we'd have them do unto us, I understand that it's hard to say, you know what, you, you need a little mercy today. What I had on my plate and the things going on in my life, I, I might have to sit that aside just for a few moments. Because that person's worth it. God loves them. And God loves us. And because God loves us and God loves them, we should love each other. And as natural as that sounds, you know, it's really not all that natural. When we live in a society, it says, you're number one. And so as we think about living our life, I want us to live like the Good Samaritan. I want us to be willing to see the distresses of others and as we can, alleviate some of that hurt. Even if it's for five seconds, five minutes, we took that time and it's worth it because their soul is worth it. Live with compassion. Today, as I ask the, as I stand here, I'm ask you a question, a very, a very simple question, but it has a profound difference on the outcome of your life. How are you living today? How are you living today? The world has a way. Sin has a way to make us very callous, make us very hard-hearted to people. And if we allow it, it can change our very view of people. But when we live life God's way, we see a different side of people. We understand that people are not very different than we are. After all, we are people. And as we need mercy, people, other people need mercy. And as we think about living by, the, by what God says, about, by his life, by the, the example of Jesus' life, we look at it and say, I want to be more like that. I want to be more like the person God wants me to be. Today, if you're a Christian and you think about your life, you say, it's really not what it needs to be. I know there's a way I ought to live. I know there's a better way. Then repent, pray, and come back to him. And live life that way. If you don't yet put Christ on a baptism for the forgiveness, remission, the sending away of sins, why not do that today? Why not have those old sins washed away? Have a new life, a new outlook on life. Or maybe there's another need you have this afternoon, this evening. You let it be known as we sing this song of invitation.